Hello, I'm Fernando Guerra, Professor of Political Science and Chicano Studies at Loyola Marymount University. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. In addition, I am the host for the Urban Lecture Series, the program you are about to view. Here at Loyola Marymount University, we take pride in having our students engaged in the civic dialogue of Los Angeles. We send our students out to the community, but in addition, through this program, we bring the community to Loyola Marymount University. We hope you are informed by today's program. And for more information about Loyola Marymount University, the Center for the Study of Los Angeles, and the Urban Lecture Series, please check out our website at lmu.edu backslash CSLA. I am Fernando Guerra, director of the Thomas and Dorothy Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles, also professor of political science and professor of Chicano Chicano Studies. Uh, today we are honored to have um, three important guests, especially for this area. They are Council Member Bill Rosendahl, representing the 11th District. Uh, he is in his second term. Before that, he is very well known to Los Angeles as a, um, uh, what, what, would you call, what would you say your title was? As a I had a lot of titles. I ran a big cable conglomerate, but I also produced and hosted a, a public affairs television show. So he was a host of a public affairs show that I think captured really the civic dialogue of Los Angeles for most of the 90s. And we are very fortunate to actually have uh, that the council member has donated those tapes to the university. Um, so we are very fortunate to, to have that along with all kinds of other archives that we have that you can take a look at our website. Again, council member uh, Bill Rosendahl. A, a very bashful council member, Rosendahl. Right. Uh, also with us is the Honorable Steve Bradford. He is a, a, the, one of the newest uh, council me excuse me, assembly members uh, in uh, the state assembly up in Cal uh, Sacramento. He represents District 51, which includes Loyola Marymount University. So he is our assembly member. So anytime we want something up in uh, uh, the state, we go up and talk to him. But since they have no money, we haven't really been up there lately. Uh, Mr. Bradford represents the communities of Westchester, obviously. Hawthorne, Lawndale, Inglewood, Lenox, parts of South Central LA, Gardena, Willowbrook, Pla uh, Playa Vista. Uh, he represents Gardena because he was also on the council for many years in Gardena and was the mayor of Gardena. So thank, uh, let's give a welcome to Honorable Steve ba Bradford. And briefly, I'm going to introduce um, Steve Zimmer, who will be joining us in about 15, 20 minutes. He is the uh, school board member, District 4, that represents this area. And actually, his district is much larger. I think it's his districts, your both districts combined, if, if, if not larger. Um, he is a school board member. He's a 16-year veteran teacher, counselor, and advocate for the community. And we'll get, get a hold of him in, in 15 minutes. Our idea when we put this together was to have three representatives from the same region, Westchester, Loyola Marymount University. All three of these elected officials represent Westchester at different levels of government. Now, they may not agree with how we titled this uh, panel, which was Too Many Governments, Why LA Doesn't Work. Exactly. Okay, and so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but before we get into the nitty gritty of some of those issues, I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, both of their backgrounds and what they were doing before they got involved in politics. Actually, as got involved as elected officials, because both of these gentlemen have been involved in politics for a long, long time. Uh, Council member Rosendahl mentioned that he was a VP for a big cable conglomerate, and also was part of his duties was uh, a, as a host for a very popular uh, um, a talk show on uh, politics and civic affairs. Um, Councilman Rosendahl, tell us a little bit more about your background and how you, that position uh, uh, prepared you to uh, serve as a city council member, number one. So what was your preparation to serve as a council member? How and when did you decide to run for politics? And then number three, what was the biggest surprise once you got on the LA City Council? Okay, uh, remind me of those questions uh, <laughs> as, as I go through my brain here, just saying a few things. Um, I was in the cable business for 22 years, okay? Prior to that, when I was a kid, uh, I worked for Bobby Kennedy, and that got me into politics. I was with him when he got killed in this town. In fact, I played a role in getting his memorabilia off the walls there in Las Vegas the other day, which was outrageous, to take the bloody shirt and put the jacket on. And the good news I have to tell you is shortly we will be 
rededicating where the Ambassador Hotel was, uh, a school complex of some 4,500 children, young ones from, from kindergarten up to 12, uh, in the location where the land was. It's beautiful. We're going to have a ribbon cutting, and it's going to be called the RFK Learning Center. Um, I, I'm going to go real quick to, sure. to get, get the uh, context of this. I've been an activist all my life. I believe if you care about things, you've got to get involved. And if you don't get involved, then don't complain. You've got to make a difference with your own energy in your own life. It is a collective energy that makes the world a better place. So get involved, get engaged in it. So I went from this to that, ended up with a master's degree in social work, uh, and then I got drafted into the Army and spent two years as a psychoanalyst in a mental hygiene clinic during the Vietnam War. I saw 89 Vietnam vets today, uh, and uh, that was an incredible experience. And, it was an awful experience, but at the same time, I got to know the general, ended up working with him and changing the Army's policies around that made life better for, for the GIs. Uh, I left that, and, and I went to work for John D. Rockefeller III, one of the richest men on earth. He read about me in Life magazine. I did that for a while, and then I went to George McGovern, who picked up Bobby's uh, mantle against, again, this Vietnam War. I ran the state of Illinois for him. I set up his national finances. I raised him millions, and I traveled with him. And then I did a couple of three more campaigns, uh, including one time I took a break from everything. And I advise you all to do this. If you don't get married by the time you're 29, uh, take off your 29th year. I did. I traveled through 39 countries with a backpack and a sleeping bag. I wanted all through Africa and South America and learned about how the rest of the world lives. Came back much stronger. First of all, grateful to be an American. How much we have that we don't even realize until you see the rest of the world. But it set me up with a stronger inner sensibilities about life, uh, near-death experiences and stuff like that that, that get you going. Um, then uh, after that experience, I managed one more campaign for a guy um, running for governor, Henry Howell of Virginia, uh, and then I dropped out of politics for a couple of years and wandered around La La Land. I went down to Venice Beach, was getting in touch with my inner self. I had some issues to deal with, especially a big Catholic boy like I was, and one of eight kids, and I was a closeted gay guy came out at 32 years of age to my family at my mother's funeral. And then I got closer to who I really am, worked on that, lived on Venice Beach. When I finally got it together and realized that uh, it, to be religious, as we're in LMU, you know, God made me this way, and God makes no mistakes, so get on with your life. And I felt good about that, called the White House. I knew the president was Carter, and I took a White House appointment to the State Department. And I did that. Uh, for a couple of years, I was running a big program around the world where it was a combination of foreign aid and trade, a uh, trade and development program it was called. Uh, when he got defeated, I then got into the cable business. A lot of us went from government uh, to cable where they were wiring the whole nation. And I came out here to California to wire different parts, run campaigns for that. One thing led to another, ended up running a cable conglomerate. Century Cable was the cable operator for 12 years. And one day, walking the beach at Martha's Vineyard with the big kingpin the chairman of the board's mansion, he said, hey, Rosendahl, we got a vacant studio and a distribution system. Why don't you do a public affairs show? You seem to have a passion for politics. And you know, when the brass ring comes, grab it. If your instincts tell you, go for it, you go for it. So I ended up doing 16 years of television, 3,000 shows. Uh, and that was my giveaway to give back the community while I, I, I ran the cable conglomerate. Last part about how do I get into politics, well, I've been around the edges of it all my life, but frankly, when I was closet gay, I figured I had no future. Even though my father said, why don't you just, you know, get a lesbian, the two of you, they'll never know. Uh, and, <laughs> I mean, I, no, my father was, you know, he loved me. Uh, and I said, can't do it, Dad, you know? I mean, and, and then finally, you know, as I enjoyed every part of my life, always enjoy what you're doing, go, go toward your instincts, go toward things that turn you on, make you feel good. And in that context, uh, one day I, I was sitting in my house, I went upstairs, looked out the window, and saw the mountains on one side, the ocean straight ahead, and LAX and LMU. I can actually see LMU from the balcony of my second floor. You're, look, you're I lucky. I in Mar Vista. <laughs> and I said, hey, this is an open seat for the city council, brand new district, some roughly 300,000 people. Mulholland is the, is the top end of it with the Brentwood and the Palisades, West LA, Mar Vista, Venice, Delray Palms, Westchester. Playa del Rey, Playa Vista, and LAX is the territory. But you, you live in Mar Vista? I live in Mar Vista. You still do? I still live there, lived there since 1991, bought a house, uh, and it's just a beautiful spot. 
and I decided to run for office, and I ran against the establishment. Okay, but when you, when you made that decision, who's the first one you called? How did you decide that? Well, that? it's interesting. People came to me first. Uh, in fact, I'm going to see this couple. They're in their late 80s now, about 88 years old, who live up in uh, uh, Mountain Gate, and um, her name, uh, Louise Frankel, called me. She says, why don't you run for the city council of Los Angeles? Because I was having a fight with the Adelphia people who took over Century Cable. In fact, uh, they're in jail, and mm -hmm. I'm not. Uh, and you can go look in the history books about that family and the situation there. Um, but I ran the conglomerate, and I, I am who I am, and uh, I ended up leaving those folks. But you were not working for the cable company when you ran no. for it. You I left, uh, and, and uh, I said, what do I do next? And there was a couple of options. One, to do more travel, since once you travel, folks, you're going to want to travel forever. Uh, and I could financially do it, but, but I didn't feel ready for that. Uh, um, you know, so I said, why don't I run for this job? And I thought about it, so I have to step down, you know, running a television show, everybody, everybody loves you. And let's just let me tell you, it was the only television show in this town that people could finish their sentences and their thoughts. You know, this soundbite journalism, bleed if it leads, all this gotcha politics, but real substantive gutsy stuff. And, and, and I just loved doing that, but every politician who was anybody of any note would come on my show because they never had an opportunity to do that anywhere else. So did anybody tell you, hey, Bill, you, you can't win, what are you thinking? Well, they did, of course, and, and the established order, which is the Supply of Vista business, which I went to a tea party last night where they really beat on me, some 300 residents there. I came out against phase two of Playa Vista uh, at that point because I didn't feel enough groundwork was done with the communities around there to discuss it through. So Playa Vista got real angry. They wrote hundreds of thousands of dollars of checks against me. And then the people, you know, we're living in a new age, this new technology, everybody's texting each other, looking at their Blackberry systems. People were, were emailing each other. Rosendahl, another 50,000 was just thrown in uh, by a developer against Rosendahl. So all of a sudden I became the people's candidate versus the established candidate. And once people begin to realize nobody owns you and you are your own person, people tend to flock to you. You, you want to do your intro? Yes. Go do Thank it. you. Uh, <laughs> he's, still, he's still a host. Uh, we, yeah, we, we have uh, joining us uh, Steve Zimmer, who is the um, school board uh, member for District 4 of the LA Unified School District. Uh, before he, be he just got elected this past year. Uh, before that, he was a 16-year veteran, uh, a teacher, counselor, advocate, and community activist. In uh, 1998, he founded Marshall's Multilingual Teacher Career Academy that served late that later as an early model for LA USD's Career Ladder Teacher Academy. And I can go on and on about Mr. Simmer. He's one of my favorite elected uh, uh, officials, along with the other two here. These are my three favorite elected officials, uh, <laughs> mostly because I voted for all three of them, and they represent LMU, and uh, we need their help. Um, so we here we are. <laughs> yeah. So this is the Urban Lecture Series at Loyola Marymount University, sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have with us Council Member Bill Rosendahl, Assembly Member Steve Bradford, and School Board Member Steve Simmer to talk about how the three of them got into politics, what politics is all about, and how they interact with one another. Uh, we were just talking to uh, Councilman uh, Bill Rosendahl. Um, what surprised you more? when you got to the city council. I'm sure you had a vision of, this is what I'm gonna do, this is what it's all about, and now you've been there for what, five years? Six, four and a half. Four and a half years? What's the biggest surprise you've had about being First a, of all, a council you know, member? Running for office is totally different than governing. Uh, and I really didn't know what the job was. I knew it was representing the people, some three. But you didn't thousand. campaign like that. I don't know what this job is about, vote for me. No, no, no well, uh -huh. you look them in the eye and you answer their questions and, 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 and you have a vision. My vision was I'm fed up with gridlock. And this district is the worst gridlock district in the city. And why is it gridlocked? And what can I do to change that uh, was one of my issues. So you were against gridlock. So that's easy. We're all against gridlock. You were against, you were against Playa Vista? I was against what they were doing with the outreach of Playa okay, Vista. What, what else were you time. against? Um, well, I was for a lot of things. Oh, what were you for? <laughs> First of all, I was for the grassroots democracy that has developed through neighborhood councils. So you're for neighborhood councils? I am. I'm for anywhere with anybody who wants to get engaged in the political process. We have eight neighborhood councils in my district. I empower them all. I work with them all. I listen to them all. And I like that kind of grassroots democracy. 
But what I learned, and when I got in office, I had that's, that's another level. Of, should we have had a president of the school board council here? Because now that's another level of government? Oh, yeah. All of these levels of government have to work together. If we don't work together, we can't function for the people. Yeah, but they really don't have much power. They have tons of power. Like what? Ooh, which the, one? the neighborhood councils. Well, the neighborhood councils have the power if the elected official uh, believes in the people involved in neighborhood councils. I don't know everything. I have to learn things. Every day I learn a million different things. I have to build consensus. I have to build coalition. I have four jobs as this elected official. One, I'm a policymaker, which means I make laws. Uh, two, uh, I am the constituent service link. You've got the, the rock, you know, who's going to trim your trees? Who's going to fix this? They go through me, and I kind of give energy to the bureaucracy. So I'm the link between the constituent and the bureaucracy. The third job I have is literally where the rubber hits the road, all land use issues. That's why LMU uh, and its 20-year development plan, Playa Vista that, that you're and its for. development plan, all of these projects come under my land use issues. You're, you're for LMU, and, and right? And four uh, is accessibility. Yes. You, he's very accessible just, just right here. Just to let him know about LMU, real quickly, there was a neighborhood council the other night. The place was packed with LMU graduates. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. for LMU. Of and course. I said, what so do you want? I, Pepperdine? So However, I said uh, there must be a buffer zone between the residents on McConnell. where, where yeah, We agree. They should move a little bit further away from us. <laughs> Secondly, you need more parking here. If you're going to do all these special events, you better have more parking. We have more parking than any university that I know of. Go ahead. <laughs> well, anyhow, uh, <laughs> we'll leave that for another day. But anyhow, you, you, okay. You, biggest surprise. Uh, the biggest, biggest surprise being an elected official that you didn't expect. The terrible abuse that people give us. They use the word politician like it's an, a four-letter word. And you are the worst. I'll never forget, I'm campaigning for this office. Never been in politics in my life. I got elected two days after my 60th birthday. I'm, I, I'm banging on doors, you know, because I like to meet people. And I like the energy of that. And uh, they say, there's a politician at the door. <laughs> and that was like a bad word. I said, wait a minute. I just happen to be a guy running for office. Give me a break. There is so much animosity and hatred and, and attitude out there uh, that is so bad that only a nutcase would run for office. I mean, and put up with it unless you really believe you can make a difference. Like Maureen Kindle. Do you see Maureen Kindle? Stand up for one second, Maureen. Maureen is one of the most amazing community civil servants there are. Then you have John Gregory over there. John, stand up for a second. He was an alumni here from LMU. He, he now works for me. He was in this very class a uh, couple well, of years he's ago. He's a great addition yeah. to my staff. So, you know, the, the, the worst problem was the sensibilities that, you know, I had to take two years to finally get people to realize I'm a straight shooter and a good guy and I'm listening. I'm trying to figure out what's best. I don't have all the answers. But so it's let me the ask trust you one more. factor in the belief in electeds. Yeah. Um, you being gay, how did it yeah. come up in the, in the, you are gay, right? Yeah, right. Okay. Um, <laughs> you, how did it come up in the election? Oh, it was terrible. Hey, you know, but, it, but we're the West Side, so it's a little bit more open around here. People aren't as awful in terms of the prejudice of it. But I was banging on doors in Westchester, uh, which is sort of a moderate, um, family community, and pe people came running up to me, I want to know what that gay agenda is. I said, there's no gay agenda. We, you know, we just want our basic civil rights. Then there was a fundraiser organized for me in the Palisades, and it was a religious group of Muslims, and when they found out I was gay, they canceled the fundraiser. Did they give so, you the money, though? No. No. Oh. <laughs> no. They've now forgiven, and now they love me and all that, but uh, uh, those were the two things. They were blemishes rather than a major explosion. Steve Bradford. State Assembly. He's been in local government uh, at the uh, city of Lomita for a long time. Gardena. Uh, Gardena, excuse me. <laughs> I am so sorry about that. Gardena, Lomita, they're kind of in the same area. <laughs> oh, um, Pasadena, Alabama. Yeah. Pasadena. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, uh, current Price was the Assembly member, and he won a special election to the State Senate because uh, um, Mark Willie Thomas won a, a district in the, the, for the County Board of Supervisors, so all these musical chairs. Uh, Steve Bradford won uh, that seat and um, started serving in Sacramento. Very first question to you is, what surprised you the most about being in Sacramento? Then I want to go back through a little bit through your political career. Uh, just the partisanship. I mean, the mere fact, um, I had just spent 12 years as a city councilman in the city of Gardena. And on local government, you serve with Republicans, you serve with independents, you serve with a variety of folks that don't even claim party, and they have the diverse issues and concerns, but you find a way to get things done. 
in Sacramento, it's just a wall. It is truly a wall of partisanship. And just watch it one day, and you watch how the votes go up. You'll see the Dems vote one way, and you'll see the Reaps vote another way. And you can sit with your colleague from the other side of the aisle, and you can talk, discuss, have great dialogue, have the same interests at heart discussing these things, but when it comes to the vote, they say no, or they say yeah when we say no. So uh, the partnership was the greatest yeah, thing. But you, the Democrats are in, uh, what, they're in your house, there 51. are 51 Democrats and 39 Republicans. 29. 29, excuse me. And so you have, you guys have the majority. Why, what, what do you care what the Republicans say? Because we can't get every Democrat to go up on issues, too, that you would think are Democratic issues. And I guess the biggest thing is the risk diversion that you find members of the legislature, individuals who were mavericks when they ran or if they were in other levels of government would, consume, uh, would be viewed as very progressive and you become very moderate once you get to Sacramento, again, because of term limits. And everybody thought 20 years ago term limits was this great idea. No one should be a lifetime politician or elected official because I too don't like the word politician because you folks in here are politicians. If you decide on what the student union's gonna have on their agenda, what the menu is at the cafeteria, you're politicians because you're involved in the political process of what changes here on this campus. So I too, I look at myself as a public servant who happens to be elected, and that's the way I describe it. But um, you have Democrats, I mean, you have both Democrats and Republicans now due to term limits who are afraid to take chances because you only have six years up there, so you don't want to offend anyone. And you're constantly sticking your finger in the wind trying to figure out which way the political winds are going to blow for you uh, for your next election. I've been there for six months, and uh, it's just amazing. And like I said, I spent 12 years in local government, enjoyed every bit of it, and much of what uh, Councilman Rosendahl states, uh, you had the direct interaction with your constituents on local level, and you can see the results of your effort by a phone call you can make to the Public Works Department or the Police Department, and you have something fixed almost like this. It doesn't happen like that in Sacramento. So, um, you know, that's probably the biggest. I mean, that, that's what I was gonna kind of develop, is that you served at both levels of government, the local level, city council member, and now the, the state level. Mm -hmm. and, and the biggest difference is that you can make individual phone calls for individual problems. But at the city level, you can't solve the major social issues. You could deal with them to some extent as they impact the city, but it's difficult for you to really address the uh, social welfare issues, health care. Uh, there are no health care. There is no health care department in the city of L.A. or in the city of Gardena. Uh, so th those are the things that you can deal with. Mm -hmm. um, but so what is hampering that ability for the state to deal with uh, health care, to get its budget in order? What's go Everything we hear is so negative about uh, Sacramento. Yeah, it is, and I, I was very popular in Gardena City Council. Now I go to a 13% approval rating, not as an individual, but collectively as a body. So we're well, somewhere we still, between. We still love you here at Loyola Marymount. Thank you. Yes. Share the love. Uh, but um, it's the budget, and I mean, uh, in my short period, we, we did budget drills a day. We did some last week. We did some on Monday. Right now, folks, you can't cut to solve a $20 billion deficit. And you have a governor who all he wants to do is say cut. You have folks on the other side of the aisle with R next to their name, all they want to say is cut. And I'm sorry, you cannot solve a budget deficit of that magnitude simply by cuts. And I will take you back 20 years ago when Willie Brown, Speaker Willie Brown, who will probably be the greatest speaker to ever serve the state of California and probably this nation, and why we have term limits today, because they just said, let's get rid of Willie Brown because he was too powerful. But 20 years ago, when Pete Wilson was governor and Willie Brown was still speaker, the state of California had a $14 billion deficit, just $6 billion short of where we are today. And they worked it out. They worked it out by having $7 billion in cuts and $7 billion in new revenues. We have no new revenues on the table. So how does the, po the population continue to grow, the service needs continue to grow, but the pie continues to shrink? You have to grow the pie as well. And you grow the pie through new revenues, and you will see no one willing to go up on new revenues or taxes, whatever you want to call it, and it's a variety of ways to raise revenues. It doesn't necessarily run businesses out of California because that's what you'll say 
California's business is not business friendly, too many taxes, too many of this. No one wants to do business here. You ask the average person, are they willing to pay more taxes? And chances are, if you say, I'm going to improve your services, the average person will say yes. They will say yes. But if you spin it in a way where we're going to take away something, we're going to drive business out, we're going to make situations bad for folks, everybody's going to say no. But at the end of the day, it's bad by not having the revenues. So we need new revenues. That's why we can't deal with health care. That's why we're dealing with education problems right now. We just, I just left the Capitol today. And we had a couple hundred students, probably a thousand students uh, from Cal State, uh, the UC system, protesting right now on the steps of Capitals. Uh, some of the independent universities were there this week. And they're saying, don't take our money away. And I agree, don't take your money away. If you guys are struggling to pay for college right now, why raise fees by 32%? Yeah, well, we want Cal grants to be increased. It, it, without a doubt. And you got a governor who we're wants not gonna, to. We're not going to let you out of the room until you agree to Well, I already agree with it. I did, I did a cash for college workshop a couple of weeks ago, and I appreciate the folks from LMU that came out. Because we have to continue to provide money to educate folks like yourself. So, so you're a former uh, local government. Mm -hmm. It's now estimated that about 40% of the state legislature previously served at the local level, either in the city council or a school board. County soup or right, something. Right. Uh -huh. And the constant complaint I hear from local city council members is that the state legislature oftentimes tries to balance the budget on the backs of cities and school districts by taking money away from them. And even though you 40% of you are from there, what is it that you hear from local governments right now, and what is it that they ask you to do? Not take their money. And I mean, really, and it's a formula that we're looking at right now that will shift some transportation money down to local government because here, the money flows in, in, in a very just simple way. Federal government, federal government to the state, state down to the counties, and we, the local government, it's lost to get it, but, the, uh, but it's generated through local government it goes to the state and goes back out to the federal. So we don't get all our money back. So uh, the point is we're trying to give cities more autonomy by funding, direct funding them and letting them choose the projects that they do versus continue to depend on the state. And I think that would empower local government because at the end of the day, as the councilman states, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's when you get the trees trimmed, the, you know, the potholes fixed, the, those things that mean the most outside of, you know, public safety and things of that nature, people want constituent services. They want to pick up the phone and call someone and know their, their problem's going to get solved. So. Yeah. Steve Simmer, teacher, advocate, now an elected official. When he first ran, no one gave him a chance. They thought that he was uh, not going to win, maybe not even come in second, maybe not even come in third. You had to come in fourth because I think there was only four candidates, so nobody was going any, any, any lower than that. There is nothing more important than schools. Every single survey that the Center for the Study of Los Angeles here at Loyola Marymount University has conducted, we rank schools number one in terms of residents, voters. Everybody says that there's education is number one. Give them the most money. Forty-five percent of the state budget goes to K through 12. It, it's, uh, it, it's pretty amazing. Yet. On, on the totem pole of prestige of the position, school board members at the bottom. I, Thanks, man. I, I, <laughs> I'm just stating what my research says. All right. okay. All good. Uh, I know of no incumbent state legislator or no incumbent council member that has ever given up their seat to run for school board. But I know of hundreds of school board members who have given up their seat to run for council or state legislator. Yet education is the most important issue that we grapple with. So why do so many individuals uh, end up leaving school boards for these other positions? Well, I think, first of all, hey everybody. Good evening. Um, thanks for having me. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Guerra, for having me. Um, why do people leave? Well. Um, it's it, you know it's really hard. I mean you know because we're, our hand our hands are tied. Tied by and, who? And by Steve Bradford well, here? Not Steve in, in particular. But, but he represents I mean, the state. But but uh, you know it, it, it is we do um, we're going to try and raise revenue. I, I have pushed really hard in in we have a six hundred twenty million dollar budget deficit, um, which is our chunk of the the twenty billion dollar state uh, deficit. And I've pushed really hard for this, um, this thing we call the revenue reduction balance uh, that 
before we go to our bargaining units and, 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 and our constituents and say, this is w what we need. We want to look everybody in the eye and say, we've done every conceivable thing that we can do to raise revenue. And what I've kind of run up against is, is we, don't, we don't raise revenue. It's not what we do. I mean, we raise revenue by getting kids in seats every day, but that's not really the, the kind of the-, the Well, the explain that mentality. to the students, that every time a kid attends that day, right. The yeah, state gives you money. And that, that's how we're funded, by, right. a, by ADA. But ADA, I'm, average, average daily, daily attendance. attendance. And, but we don't, as a, as a buy, we don't raise revenue. So, for example, getting the, par the limited parcel tax on, uh, approved through the board. And that was just a very different mindset because the idea is that we always go to Sacramento. We always go to Washington, D.C., and, and we need to continue to do that. But, um, but we also need to continue to, to look at revenue. But I think the, to get to your question, the reason why folks leave is because, um, you know, we get this deficit and we get all of these things that we're controlled by, ed code, other, other things like that, that we don't legislate ourselves. And they tie our hands in a lot of the things that we do. So, you know, I think that that's, that's a lot of the frustration. I mean, look, I had to send, you, I, I had to vote on Tuesday to send uh, 5,100 uh, layoff notices. And I mean, these are, these are people I know. I taught for 18 years. I mean, these are, I mean, I'm laying off people who are friends of mine. I'm laying off students that I taught that then became teachers. And, you know, it's, it's extraordinarily painful, but what are you gonna do? Because we're bound by, uh, we're, by we're bound by ed code. We're bound by other processes that mandate us to do it. So you think that you're gonna be a decision maker and a leader, and then you get up there and you find out your, your hands are tied. And I think that's why a lot of people leave. Why did you decide to run for public office? Well, I, I saw, I, I mean, like, I'm a lifelong educator. I mean, that's, that's literally, that, that's what I know. I mean, I can engage in really long debates about pedagogy and, and, and things like that. And, and uh, you know, and, and I also know a lot about schools and communities. That's what I did for 18 years, and uh, and and we had success in the community that I did the most work in in Northeast Los Angeles. We were able, and it took a long time. It took 10 years. We were able, though, to raise the graduation rate in that community to in in, in 19 in 1998 when we started. It was around it was around 41, 42 percent. By the time we were by the time I ran for office, it was in the low 80s. And that was everybody working together. Um, and so I saw this model for what I thought could work. And then I looked at the school board, and there was not one single teacher on that board. And I, I, just, I just said, well, you know, that's got to, that voice has got to be there. And, uh, and that got some traction. Uh, I think the other reason why I ran was, I thought, uh, and this was my, my big awakening, I thought that I could really bring people together. Uh, I have a lot, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a labor guy. You know, I have a lot of uh, friends in, in, in not only UTLA, but in all the labor unions across Los Angeles. Um, but I also have a lot, I, I was a Teach for America. Uh, I came into Teach for America in 1992. As many of you know, Teach for America is really connected to the charter community. So I know a lot of the folks in the charter community. I thought I could bring people together and stop kind of a lot of the adult fighting that went on. Yeah. So what was I wrong about that? Yeah. Um, that was uh, that that was that was in instantly shattered. So, do you think you did you think you were going to win, or were you just running to raise certain issues? No, no, no. I, it never occurred to me. I mean, it, it never it occurred was, to you that you were going to win. The, the whole thing was really surreal. You know, I mean, it, it was. You know, I never really thought of myself, you know, kind of like Bill said, I never really thought of myself as a politician. Um, and I'm not, I'm not very, I gotta be honest with you, like I'm not very, my, my staff like yells at me all the time. They're like, why did you say that? I said, well, that's what I think. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that's, what, that, that, that's, how I, that's how I feel. But people can't, well, people have to hear that. And if they don't like me, they don't like me, that's fine. Um, it never occurred to me really that, that, that I would win. Um, I had really no contingency for that. Um, and uh, you kept know, your, you kept your other job until you actually got elected. Well, no, I mean, I yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not allowed to teach anymore, so that that was a shocker. Um, and so, you know, I, I, 
and it still feels surreal. It really feels like I still feel like I'm gonna wake up, have my eight minute commute back and, and go back into the classroom. I've never worked in a building before. I've never, I've never worked in an office, but I still try to open windows at Poetry because it's, I mean, that's what. You get confused by elevators and very, things. I've never been, I never, so. <laughs> Yeah, I never thought, I, mean, I, I really had no game plan, so. Yes. Steve, Steve Bradford, when you got elected, everybody knew you were gonna win. This time, this not time. the first time. But the first time you lost. Yeah. And, and we all thought you were gonna win, so we didn't understand how you lost, but that's a different question. Uh, anyway, so you, you knew you were gonna win. This time around? Yeah. I, I, let me tell you, in this business, you never take anything for granted, because what Professor Guerra fails to mention, I ran four times before I was elected to Gardena City Council. First time in 1990, I lost by 400 votes. Kind of the, the same thing you do when you date, you keep asking the girl out. No, you know, and, you know and, say and, yes. and at some point you wear them down by persistency, you know, eventually they say yes. <laughs> so in 1992, I did it again, lost by 32 votes, okay? So I come back in 94, I say, hey, I'm a slam dunk. I lost by 32, I went from 400 to 32, it's moving in the right direction. 1994, I lose by a little over 400 votes. And I'm like, wow, I'm going backwards. And in this business, you lose one time, okay, you know, we'll chalk it up to inexperience. You lose two times, they really start looking at you a little sideways and saying, do you really want to do this? Or should you really be doing this? You lose three times and you know, like, you know, you need to go find something else to do. That's Nobody like, wants to support you. No one wants to volunteer. You can't raise any money. That's three strikes. Yeah, it's that's like three strikes. Should, and you know. so the fourth time, I, 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 I won, I was the first African-American ever elected in the city of Gardena. I wasn't the first to run, but I think I was the first to be as persistent and straight shooting as Steve stated, because at the end of the day, people just want straight talk. And as Councilman Rosendahl said, you probably got three guys up here who, if you said you're a politician, we all bristled at that because I view myself as just like you guys, at one point I was a college student, I was a biology major, with every intention on being a doctor, and my mother hasn't forgiven me to this day. <laughs> and, and it's been downhill ever since. I switched my major my senior year, I said I'm not going to no one's medical school, so let me quit fooling myself, and uh, I switched to poli-sci, got a degree in poli-sci, uh, did a paralegal uh, work, uh, looked at law school, did a little summer trial program at law school and got hired by IBM. And I said, I'm gonna make a whole lot of money as a marketing rep at IBM, because I like wearing suits every day. And worked at IBM for seven years, didn't make a whole lot of money, but learned a whole lot. Left IBM and went to work for LA Conservation Corps, which is now probably the largest urban youth corps in the nation. I was their recycling coordinator for four years um, and that was an awakening. I, I got to work with young folks, 18 to 24, many who were high school dropouts, trying to get their GED, trying to get their high school diploma, just trying to find themselves. And um, that exposed me to a whole lot. And just fast forward, left there, worked for the city of Compton for a couple of years as their solid waste director, uh, was the district chief of staff for the late Congresswoman Juanita Milliner McDonald. And um, from there, spent the last 12 years while I was on council with Southern California Edison as a region manager of public affairs. So. You know, I can't keep a job, so yeah. I'm here today. So, um, in your your district is um, not majority African American no, in terms not at of the all. population, but the plurality of voters are African American. Yes. So, um, and what w describe the district a little bit more? Um, like I say we have Westchester here, Playa Vista, but it's we're at the corner of it. Yes, you're you're at the very end of it, but as we move south and a little east. Um, we have a large Asian population. Like I say, Gardena was a majority Japanese city when I grew up there. My family was one of the first African-American families on my street, and uh, we moved there in 1960. It wasn't your street until you moved in. It, without a doubt, and it took me almost 20 years to realize what white flight was, because you had heard it as a kid, but really didn't understand it, and then that, not until I got a little older, and I remembered how folks who were my neighbors on Monday their houses were up on sale, for sale on Friday, and how a whole neighborhood almost changed in about a four year period. And I said, oh, that was white flight. Because, you know, uh, but that's what happened. Uh, my family moved to Gardena because they looked for a better opportunity for their, their kids. It was a great neighborhood, it was a safe community, and you know, but anyway, that's a whole other thing. Yeah. 
This is the Urban Lecture Series at Loyola Marymount University, sponsored by the Levy Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have with us Council Member Bill Rosendahl, the 11th District, uh, Steve Bradford, the 51st Assembly District, and from District 4 of the LA Unified School District, uh, the Honorable Steve Zimmer. Um, how often do you three guys talk? You all represent Westchester. How often do you talk? How often do you get together and try to coordinate efforts? I'm, I'm well. I'm just new. Like I said, I'm not making any excuses. I've been in the legislature for six months, so I'm really just getting my feet on the ground as far as reaching out to folks. But I've talked to the councilman on quite a few occasions. He was uh, a big supporter of mine um, during the campaign. Mr. Zimmer and I have yet to sit down and talk about education, but I assure you, we will, and they'll be visiting real soon, or we'll be visiting each other real soon. So, um, Steve Zimmer, the the school district is gigantic. In your district, there I, I think there are 750,000 uh, residents, which, which would make it bigger than several states in terms of uh, population size. That's just your district. Right. And, and Council Member uh, Rosendahl's 11th district, I think is 100% in your district, mm -hmm. I, I, I believe. Think so yep. so Close. what could the city of Los Angeles do for the schools in the 11th district and your fourth district what is it that you if you if you um could articulate what what could the city itself even though it's having its own budget yeah, problems the, the, it's i mean it's a couple of things very you know very clearly number one and, and, and bill and i have talked about this is joint use and uh you know one of the one of the crimes of the school district is you know, all throughout the city. I mean, I mean, literally all throughout the. And I have the most diverse uh, school board district um, of any of my my colleagues. Um, whether you're in East Hollywood or you're in the Palisades or you're, you're in Westwood or you're in Westchester, you know, LA is very park poor, and um, you you know you you see uh, parents um, with their kids walking by, you know, padlocked elementary schools on on the weekends um, where you've got all this great playground equipment that we that we put in and 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 it can't be used by the community because of our rules because of insurance because of liability because of all of these things right and there ought to be a state law what's that there ought to be a state law that, uh, <laughs> right. but uh, but but what we're doing for example uh, in, in in the councilman's been a great supporter of this over at University High in West Los Angeles is this joint use project with the YMCA where um, we're building just a state-of-the-art facility there that's going to be used during the week by the uni high school students but on the weekends and, and at night and all throughout the rest of the time is going to be used by the community these are the kind of things that um, all the time we're going we're going back and forth on because schools need to be neighborhood centers and it's it's a partnership with the city it's a partnership with the county one of the big issues I'm concerned about is hunger as we're in this economic crisis more and more of our students are coming to school hungry literally hungry and you know but you can't get the you can't get the school district programs to work with the federal programs, to work with the county programs, so that everybody can get registered in like a one-stop setting. And parents register their kids to school. Why should they have to go somewhere else to fill out all the other forms? Uh, and so those are the kinds of things, those cross-pollination things, that uh, I think the city and the county and, and needs to work with the school district on all the time. And we need to you know, just break down the silos because it's all about families. You know. They're, they're not looking at like, oh, is that an LAUSD thing or is that a city of LA thing? They're looking at, we need something, so. Councilman? Well, you know, the kids live in my district with the parents that are my constituents. So the kids are my constituents too. So whatever their interests are, people bang on my door. Marlene Cantor was the member of the school board for the first three years uh, of my job. Uh, and, and Steve's been there uh, for six months to a year, I guess, by now, right? That's eight months. Eight months. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's the coordination. For instance, um, we can give a grant for beautification. School has to accept that we plant the trees. Uh, we could have a terrible accident in a school, in an area there. Parents come to me and say, we need signs, stop signs. We need uh, more painting on the street uh, for crosswalks. We, we, we need to find a way to do it. That's what we do. 
um, there are use, using the schools for other meetings and, and, and community groups and so on. So we call each other all the time and we have to work together and we should work together. Uh, the charter school movement is another movement that I support. I support any aspect that gives a kid an opportunity to learn. And charter schools, if they take a deep interest uh, uh, in, in creative strategies, I'll support a charter school. I went to a charter school the other day. They needed some variances, which, you know, land use is me, uh, and they needed my support to do that. So we, we have to talk to each other, as we also do uh, with Sacramento on every issue. But, uh, you know, my biggest problem right now, to tell you the truth, how many of you from California, raise your hand. Okay, just to let you know that we donate 50 billion to Washington, D.C., then we get back. We're a donor state. You know, here we are, 36 million people, and two senators from a little state of nothingness uh, get like $1.15 on their tax dollar versus us, 78 cents. So the federal government does not return the money to us. Why? You got a United States Senate that is undemocratic. You got two senators from each state, and those hundred people sit there as if they were equals. When we represent 36 million people, and we have two people, two great lead ladies, ladies, but they don't have the power among the others. So I'm you, very you don't you don't like our constitution. I think it has to change with the Senate. They give it too much power for these little states to have as much power. You know, it isn't one person, one vote, and the Senate is extremely powerful, and that's where the block comes in the road of money coming back. We're one-eighth of the House of Representatives, which is democratic, one-eighth, where, where, where the population boundaries draw. There we have power on budgets and dealing. But the Senate is worthless when it comes to us getting the kind of support that we put our money in to do. Like Obama, for instance, what he should do right now, I'm with a half a billion dollar deficit. We're going to lay off 86 uh, daycare oh, wait, workers. Wait, who has ha half a billion dollars? The city of LA. Half a billion. Yeah. We're going to closing parks. We're going to be closing libraries. We're going to be changing our hours. We're going to be getting rid of employees. Wouldn't it be great if some of the stimulus money would go to the local schools, to the local governments, uh, to, to the state governments, to the county governments? I don't want to lay off workers that provide service, intervention, prevention services. Kids use libraries. Kids use parks. Uh, I mean, that's what I'd like this administration to do rather than bailing out the banks and the big boys back east. But here, California does not get its fair share of its own money. And right now, one good news on transportation is we all voted for Measure R in L.A. County. Yep. The, two thirds of the people said yes. Measure R is a half cent sales tax. It was countywide, not just the city. Countywide, it's beautiful. And that puts 30 to $40 billion into transportation infrastructure. We're, we're but not right away, over... Over 30 years. So what we want to do now is get the Obama administration to create an infrastructure bank where we can borrow off of future receipts that will come in on the sales tax. So over the next 10 years, we can accelerate all these projects. Look, because I want to be a little selfish. I'm going to be 65 in a couple of months. I want to be alive to get on some of these high mass transit things. The only way it's going to happen is if the federal government lets us borrow from them so we can have more money in 10 years and do all the projects. We're calling it the 1030 program which we want to do in 10 years what 30 years is to do. Californians have put their money, LA County, where their mouth is, and now we're saying in the federal government. So what, where we lack, frankly, is a congressional delegation, I don't care if it's David Dreyer on the right or, or Henry Waxman on the left, to get beyond their politics and say Californians, transportation infrastructure, critical need. We don't have to be Republicans or Democrats on that. This is non-ideological work. And we find on the local level the best. It's not I ideologically driven. We're That's nonpartisan. Right. We and don't have to deal with that craziness. But even if you're nonpartisan, there are 15 council members. You're one of 15. I think there's only one Republican on that. There's two or three somewhat in this well, and that, but we don't think about that. <laughs> we talk about transportation infrastructure. Well, there's one registered Republican. The other two changed their registration. Right. The other two ra ra uh, changed the registration to uh, um, uh, decline, yeah, decline to state because there were so many Democrats in the council they wanted to get along and they but figured. I'm not a Democrat Democrat. You're not. I'm an old Bobby Kennedy Democrat. I don't this know what party, that means. This party moved away from me. So I the, didn't move away from So them. does that mean that you're more liberal or more conservative than I current? I don't even like those labels. Like, for instance, uh, I would be for Medicare for all. It's, it's our tax dollars. The health safety net should be a responsibility of our government, rather than wars overseas where you're throwing in billions. How about taking care of the health of our people, the education of our people, and the infrastructure of our people? Let's do that. I'll vote for him. I'm 
Yes, I did vote for you. Um, Steve Zimmer deals with education, although as you've heard, he also has to deal with uh, uh, nutrition policies, also got to deal, there's a police force for the school district, so there's all kinds of different issues he has to deal with. Steve Bradford deals with everything, because the state deals with everything. Even the military, they, the National Guard is under, under the state. Uh, the city deals with a lot, but as we've talked in terms of uh, students, there are two major issues that still cities dominate, public safety and land use. So how is the new chief of police doing? He's the best we've ever had. Let me tell you He's why. better than the other guy? Billy Bratton was a show dog. Good guy. <laughs> Good guy. A show dog. A show dog. I know about Does shows, that mean his, folks. Uh, I've done shows. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you all about it. What Billy uh, did in seven years was take an LAPD that did not represent its people and made it brown and black and Asian and white. He put 16% women in there. He even has gays in there. We're all part of it, and we reflect the community. He boosted the morale, made being a cop a good thing, and brought crime down. That was great. Uh, that okay? sounds good. Okay. All right. All right, but he's a show dog. The next guy <laughs> we have now uh, is a cop's cop. His father was a cop. His wife was a detective. His son is a cop. This guy yeah, knows So when they go out to dinner, every, there's a lot of guns. <laughs> he knows everything about being a police officer. The first thing he did for me, I got big problems in my district. You know, I got people in cars and campers, some of them really out of control. We have some people on the beach that are just causing problems to a lot of other people. First thing he did was give me people with experience mm -hmm. in that. And they even told me today, they're going to have six more officers. They're going to work closely with me on the homeless issues. I toured the Manchester Square down the street over yep. here. I'm looking for places, uh, safe places where cars and campers can go in the night rather than, you know, continuingly to create these situations. So, wait, he you're, saying, so you're saying he, he's the best police chief, better than William Bratton, even better than Councilman Parks, who's one of your colleagues now? God bless Councilman Park. I love him as a colleague. <laughs> <laughs> and Bratton is an old friend of mine, don't get me wrong. Okay, <laughs> okay. The second like thing that we talk about the city of LA and every city dominating is land use. That's right. You determine how the land is going to be used in terms of zoning. You zone it for manufacturing, for retail, for housing, for all kinds of different issues. That, that is the number one power that you, you really have. What are the three major land use issues facing the 11th district. Oh, I got a bunch. It's oh, the just three, just three. Uh, first, uh, I, I have phase two of Playa Vista, uh, which is 27 housing units, fresh new units, some more parks and some more commercial. Wait, wait, 27 housing units? 2,700. Yeah. Oh, but more we're for housing, housing right? We like housing. Uh, we love housing. I love housing. More housing in the district, the happier I am, because that means more voters? car trips oh, into our district. If you don't realize, my district has a little town called Santa Monica. It's in the heart of my district. It's 84,000 people. They created jobs. What happened was we had this crazy Prop 13, right? And so you could no longer have property uh, taxes to run local government. Smart little town, all the little towns are smart. They focus on a little piece of land and there are a whole bunch of people involved in a little piece of land. They have seven elected officials and I'm one for 300,000, they're seven uh, for 84,000. Just so you know the, the dimension of, of, of their focus. They changed all their zoning in the 80s and 90s because the way you make a city budget work now is sales tax, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, business taxing. So excuse me, for the students, we were talking about this, we call that fiscalization of land use. Okay, so with that in mind, Santa Monica has become the job capital of the west side. We have 200,000 car trips going through my district to go to work in Santa Monica. So if you really uh, want to know why I got gridlock, well, it's, yeah. it's Santa Monica. Just charge them a tax when they cross over. You should do that, but besides um, the, the, more, the uh, Playa Vista, mm -hmm. there's LMU. LMU. Wait, 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 we're one of your top three problems? Top three land projects, you asked me. Yeah. Top problems. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's hear this. Here's LMU, this great campus in the yep. heart of a, of, a, of a nice bedroom community. You know? Agree. Uh, and we know that from September to Halloween, things happen outside of campus where kids are living in a group house and they're away from their folks. Party time. But those aren't, those are like. Young man, I just watched texting over there. Well, they text each other, and two, three hundred people show up at a party. And so, relationships between. Okay, LMU we'll invite you next time. Come on. <laughs> My brother lives there and loves it. I mean, he's a party guy. But, but bottom line is, well, you got to. Give us his cell phone number, we'll text him. A 20 them. year. <laughs> a 20 year development project that I'm really excited about. 
but we have to work with all groups. Okay, the third major project, it's called Bundy Village. Bundy it's Village. It's the other congested end of my district, mm. which is where uh, Olympic and Centinella, or Bundy, cross. There's an 11.6 acre piece of land. The developer wants but to What was it before? What is it right a, now? Light industrial, and it sits, okay. it's basically sitting vacant there. And he wants to um, create uh, senior citizen housing and support systems and medical to support. That's it. a good idea. It's a great idea, but I'm in the midst of this terrible NIMBYism. A lot what of does NIMBY stand for? It stands not in my backyard. Oh, I always thought it stood for not Indian, Mexican, black, or young. Oh, well. <laughs> See, Daddy's just constantly into his mind. <laughs> <laughs> So these are my three biggest projects. Then there's a, potentially three right down the road over there in Playa del Rey, a nice little beachy moment that could turn her into a, a different location. So there I have a lot of interest by local people on that. But you know, it can be a little project but you, you have to make to the a big project. I mean, you're like stuck between a rock and a hard place. I mean, you have to take a look at the vision for the whole city and the whole region. I mean, we talked about Santa Monica. We, you don't represent Santa Monica. You don't represent, you know, Lenox or Inglewood. That's right. um, but in a sense, the city of Los Angeles is so large, it is the driver of what the region is about, economically, socially, politically. There's a responsibility that all city of LA elected officials have to, in a sense, take care of the region. Right. Right. And, and so you see a project and you say, this is good for the region, right. but it's not good for my particular neighborhood. Well, we've got to get the neighborhood to see a bigger vision of things. Yeah. But that's tough to, to do. How do you do that? Very tough to do. Uh, well, you sit with them, you talk to them, you, you make the developer modify the programs, listen to what the community has to say, downsize, try to build consensus, try to build coalitions. It's not easy, but you do it all day. LMU here, what are they doing? They're meeting with all kinds of community groups from Westchester. There's an ad hoc committee, there's a council committee, there's this, there's that, and they're interacting. Uh, Kathleen is in the back of the room. She does it all the time. Uh, you know, and you bring your president in, you bring the others in, and you explain to people what you're doing. You know, informing people is mm -hmm. part of it. People have misinformation and fear. You want to get rid of that, and you want to get them to appreciate the pluses and things. For instance, the problem I'm having with the, the Bundy Village is people say, not in my backyard, but now people are coming up who are seniors who are saying, hey, I like the idea. I mean, it would be nice for me, potentially, uh, to be there. So if you can point out a need, and you can build that coalition or consensus, that's half my job yeah. is doing that. Well, we're gonna continue our conversation. We're gonna ask Steve Bradford about LAX and what he thinks about that and then get the council member to respond. We're gonna ask students to uh, line up if they have questions of one of these three uh, representatives, whether they have an internship or a job maybe, um, or whether you wanna get a good grade by asking a question. We uh, <laughs> encourage you to uh, line up at either one of these two uh, uh, mics. Um, this is the Urban Lecture Series at Loyola Marymount University, sponsored by the Center for the Study of Los Angeles. We have Council Member Bill Rosendahl with us from the 11th District. We have uh, Assembly Member Steve Bradford from the 51st District and Steve Zimmer from the 4th District of LA Unified School District. Uh, Steve Bradford, LAX, an economic engine or a problem that just needs to be mitigated? Uh, both. Um. So you're not a politician? L LAX really is is a the gateway to California. That's we have more uh, trips probably than any uh, airport in the country. But it needs to be modernized, and that's the issue. It doesn't necessarily have to be expanded to have more volume. It has to be modernized. I fly out of there every week. I'm in there twice a week, and the hardest thing is moving people through that place. It's antiquated. It's old. And when you go to Chicago or Atlanta or all these other places that have far more modern, people-friendly airports, they, they have the volume too, but they move their people through there a whole lot better. You can pull up in uh, LAX on a Monday and you see folks aligning the curb, you know, you know, four or five. All the way know. outside. Yeah, all the way outside. It could be rain. There was a uh, customer, uh, JD Powers. They they do all this customer satisfaction. They just released a customer satisfaction on airports on the top 50 airports in um, in the country. LAX was 49th. Exactly. And, and and it's about convenience. It's about user friendliness, accessibility. I mean, parking. All those things have to be improved. You, like you say, we don't need to have more flights, more planes coming in LAX. We need to move the folks who are already using the airport in a more efficient manner. So you're for a modernization? It, without a doubt. There are all kinds of different elements. Are there any particular elements that you're against that you know, that, that you've heard of? 
Um, not up to top. I mean, but those that there are, I know the councilman's going to make me aware of them, <laughs> well, and the residents as well. I mean, one one of the big one of the things that I don't understand is every time you come to L if there's any airport in the country where you need to land and then rent a car, it's LAX. And yet the car rental stuff is all over the place. I mean, it's not unusual for some poor tourist trying to return a car back to the car rental place that ends up at LMU. I mean, it's just, uh, you, uh, we, need, we need a car rental center. Yeah. You know? you gotta, Talk about gridlock and, uh, Very you know. easy, you want me to answer that right now? Absolutely. You, I, I just came from Manchester Square, it's an area around here before I came Des here. Describe where that is Manchester exactly. Square is, is down the road a piece where aviation uh, uh, and Century are. East uh, of the, east of the uh, airport, right by the uh, 405. That's region. right, and there's a big piece of land. Uh, and I walked around it, we drove around it, and, and most of it uh, is vacant now, and people have left, and the airport has bought the property. Uh, I want to put a consolidated Well, they didn't just leave, they were... They were bought out, and they had the ability to stay there if they wanted to stay or not. So they were offered top dollar to move. Right. Uh, and, and there, we're going to eventually put a consolidated rental facility. Uh, I just love what Steve said about modernization, yes, expansion, no. That's, I get elected, that's, a, that's LMU's model, too. That's how I got... Yeah, that's right. Modernization, yes. Expansion, no. That's correct. But sensitive to the neighbors is always part of that same part. Everybody, all my students think I'm extremely sensitive. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so sensitive. So, so uh, when you look at LAX, know this. It's the number one destination airport in the world. More people come to stop here or go from here to somewhere than using it as an exchange in the middle of the country go somewhere else. Why? Because we are a megalopolis from Santa Barbara to San Diego, 25 million of us from all over the earth in the largest numbers you can imagine. And so people go from here to visit home country, people from home countries come here. Number one destination point in the planet. Um, LAX has not been modernized since 1984. Tom Bradley did it, did it as we get ready for the Olympics, Maureen knows about that. And other than that, uh, nothing, nothing has happened. So it's a junky place, needs to be modernized for two reasons. One, it needs to be modernized because when you get off the plane, you're going to get into the Tom Bradley terminal that's costing us a couple of billion to do that is going to be incredibly beautiful and it's going to be a good experience coming into this country. Second, as important, is the only way regionalism happens. We have Ontario sitting over there as the Maytag man waiting for service. We have less than 5 million people going there. It can handle 12 million right now. A little bit of tooling, you can go up to 29 million. If you talk to American United and Delta, and ask them why they don't have nonstop, direct, frequent, and discounted flights out of Ontario, they'll lie, and they'll tell you there's no market there. Okay. Oh. Here's where the market comes. LAX is the cheapest takeoff and landing airport of a major airport in the United States of America. Why don't you raise the rates? The only way you can raise the rates is to do a development project through an FAA formula and pass the costs on to the airlines. So the good news will be this. When the Bradley terminal is done, and a few other things are done, we have five projects that we've called green-lighted. The Bradley terminal, the people mover, the green line, the consolidated rental, and the midfield terminal. Roughly $10 billion worth of, of, of construction and projects. As that gets online, the formula will all of a sudden tell the guys and the ladies who make the margins of profit, it's all about profit and capitalism, nothing to do about anything else, not social responsibility, just profit, okay? Uh, when they realize it's cheaper to land at LAX than Ontario, right. then you'll see nonstop direct, frequent, and discounted flights out of Ontario. Orange County's begging to go from Anaheim to Ontario with the light rail. People from the Inland Empire don't want to schlep to LAX. People in Orange County and down in San Diego right now go to LAX because they can get a flight cheaper. The airlines don't care how long it takes you to get to the gate. We on the ground do. So we're going to force regionalism by the modernization. So it becomes a win-win. Win for modernization and a win for that's regionalism. A, uh, that's a great uh, explanation of what, what needs you. to happen. Um, Steve Zimmer, I'm going to ask you questions about educational reform in the Westchester Family School. But I would actually like to have a couple of questions for the council member because he has to leave at, at 6.30. So let's have a couple of questions. Have you answered those? And then, yeah. So you know why I have to leave? Uh, I have to give a dozen eggs. I have chickens, and I, I feed them all kinds of organic Wait stuff. Wait a minute. Isn't it against land use to have no, chickens? As long as you don't have a rooster around, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need a rooster to lay an egg. 
So just know that. So I'm going to give a dozen eggs no, to a sustainability workshop event in Mar Vista where they're doing all the sustainability I stuff, and the best student is going to get a dozen eggs from Rosendahl. So I have to present it at 7 o'clock. That's oh. where I'm going. Okay. I just thought that Joe's only had chickens in Bradford's district. Everybody not in your should district. have some hens. Oh. Okay. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, gentlemen. Um, my name is April Sandifer. I'm a senior urban studies major. I have three questions, actually. Um, I come from a long line of LAUSD, uh, people who've worked for LAUSD, including myself, so it's very close to my heart. We were all raised in the system, so you know I, I appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, my two questions, or my first two questions are, what proof do you have that charter schools are better than public schools, and how do we prevent these charter schools from returning their low test score students and behavioral problem students right. back to LAUSD. And then also, how do you justify to the public the need for a parcel tax when newly built schools are being turned into charters, sometimes even before they open? Okay, and, and my third question, question was, um, how would, this morning I was listening to NPR and they were um, discussing the 4,000 layoffs. Probably were listening layoffs. to KPCC 89.9. <laughs> It said, how would you respond, or my question is, how would you respond to the statement that the expected $300 million um, savings that is projected to be saved by, the, by these 4,000 layoffs by, by completing them by July, right. um, since it's being extended to October because of the specialized process? Got that. Um, so, there's, go ahead. The, the, the statement was just that, um, why are we still gonna go through with these layoffs if the money's not actually gonna be saved? Councilman Rosendahl, do you, you voted to lay off 4,000 people? We all voted for that as an as so outside you, yeah, you, uh, opportunity. Because you have a budget, right, right. And then we'll have you address that, and then we'll have Steve Simmer address, even though the question assumes a, some, a, some certain things about charter schools. But why don't we talk to you about budget cuts? Sure. And I think, Steve Bradford, you're also doing budget cuts and laying people off, too, it's and the worst, furloughs. It's the worst time in government in modern history. Maybe maybe back in the Great Depression, I don't know if anybody's around then, I wasn't, uh, not even a twinkle in anybody's eye, but the bottom line is we are the worst budget well, situation. Why do, you, why do you say that? Your parents must have loved you. Yeah, but I wasn't even a twinkle then. Okay. Yeah. I'm one of eight kids. I'm the third of the youngest, so give me a break on that kind of thing. So um, uh, today, it was very, very painful. About 20 librarians got up and said, if you if I lose my job, the library has to shut down these different hours and these different things. I had a bunch of folks who work in parks, uh, Reckon Park, which is near our parks, come up and say the same thing. I'm very upset about it uh, because I don't want to close any parks. What's the option? I, well, here's the options. I don't want to close any parks uh, and I don't want to close any libraries. Parks and libraries are part of an intervention prevention strategy. I love cops, but I don't want to have to hire more cops and more cops at the expense of the librarian and at the expense of people working in the parks, okay? Yeah, you can clap on it because it's a tough one. Uh, so what we're going to end up doing, I don't know, I have, we have to count eight votes, ten votes, you know, we're all independent You have to, give me, the, give me the timing. Your current budget, which is fiscal year, 2009-10, which it, ends it, June 30th. You are 200 million in deficit on that one? Uh, approximately 200 million. And then when you take a look at next year's budget, you are Four to 600. 485 million. Maybe right? even more. All right. And the city's total budget is? About seven billion. Seven billion. Yeah, yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Um, I don't have any easy solutions, but I am now pu privately saying, I haven't said a public. I'm well, you're on camera. Cameras will take it is I do not want to hire more cops to attrition. Attrition means the number of cops that leave, you definitely hire to backfill them at the expense of other pro projects, programs, and people that impact the quality of life and the safety and prevention intervention strategy. Most of us, I don't know, we haven't counted numbers yet, have come to that conclusion that we cannot continue to hire to attrition. And therefore, we can save a lot of money that way. Well, the state uh, um, has been doing furloughs, yeah. which means they just have um, one day a week that's a right. worker take yeah, off. Did yeah, you guys yeah, consider yeah. that? Or we've you can't considered, do no, no, we've considered all of this, and that's why we put the 4,000 out there as a line. What has to happen is union contracts are sacred contracts negotiated over a period of years. The unions have to open them up willingly mm -hmm. and say, do we want to lose more of our workers, or are we willing all to take a 
pay right. cut. A right. furlough means a pay cut, right. you know? No, it does. It just means less money that you're going to take. The discussions are ongoing. Uh, my hope would be that we could open up contracts uh, and um, have the furlough process happen and not have to lay off these people. Okay, uh, California's unemployment is already at 12.5 percent. Right, you're laying right. off 4,000. You're laying off 5,100. Um, what's going on with their question about charter schools? Okay, what yeah, do we know me, about charter schools? Yeah, let, let, let me, uh, I, I appreciate the question and uh, I also um, appreciate both you and your family's service to the district. Um, I'll take charter schools and then I'll talk about the, the parcel tax. Um, the answer is that, that the research is inconclusive. Um, we, there are studies that show there is, uh, that, that some are very effective. There are studies that show that at best it's a wash. And there are studies that show that, um, that, that some charters are far less effective than, than public schools. Uh, the sheen is starting to come off. Uh, what is not coming off, though, is the clamoring for choice um, that, that, that families have. And that's something that's very real. And that's something that we need to respond to. But let me say this. This is what we do know, is that choice needs to be choice for everyone. Everyone. Regardless of whether a child has special needs, regardless of whether they have behavioral problems or whatever, you know. And, and for the government students, let, let, let me give you this perspective. The answer to um, bad regulation or over-regulation isn't no regulation. It's good, smart, and fair regulation. And my issue with, the, with certain charter schools is because we have no regulatory function, we don't have the same controls. And, what, and, and, and what, one of the things statistically we know that it leads to is that the LAUSD percentage of students with special needs is 12.7. The charter school percentage of students with special needs is approximately 6.3. And so it, it's, it's close to two to one. And that is, that is a disparity that, that, that's serious. When you get to what we call low incident cases, the disparity is even greater. It's approximately three to one. So are we saying that charter schools are more successful because they don't have the more challenging? No. Students? What I'm saying is, is that when you, we don't have evidence to conclusively show that, but, but what we know is that not all charter schools serve a mirrored population. Right. And so that, and it's not a philosophical statement against charters. It's just to say that if you are a public school, one of the defining elements of a public school is you serve every child that comes to your door. And if you, if you are unable to do that because of size, because of facilities, because of other things, well, things need to be worked out and arranged. But the, the, the fiscal liability on the district is profound, approximately $64 million. Let me just answer quickly your parcel tax question. And that is, is that I am be on the June ballot. That is going to be on the June ballot, and and it's a limited parcel tax. Um, it's eight dollars and sixty six cents a month. I want to be clear when I say we've passed three school bonds. But that's only for property owners, o not only for property owners. It is a regressive tax. I own that. It's a regressive oh, tax. Sleep, so most of us it, in this room are going to pay it. And so uh, we did pass three school bonds, but those bonds were only for construction. I can't use any of that for instruct. I can't. It, I can only use it for construction. I can't use it for instruction. I can't use it to fund the the actual operation of schools. And so what we're asking, LA, is, is basically to take attendance, to say here's what we're doing with reform. Here's what we're doing with accountability. This money is going to be spent at neighborhood schools. This is not going to go to centralized administration. And, and we're really going to have what was the popular nomenclature today. We're going to have an up-down vote. And it's a conversation that I'm looking forward to. And it, it, it's temporary, though. The, it's the parcel, four years. For four years. Four-year parcel tax, $8.66 a month, $100 a year for four years. Are you for this, uh, Councilman Rosendahl? I don't know yet. Uh, I look forward member, to convincing the Councilman. Yeah, Assembly <laughs> Member Steve Bradford, are you for this? I haven't. Okay. I look forward to convincing the assemblyman. Okay. <laughs> Hanif? Hi, I'm Hanif Manjoon. I'm a senior economics major. 
I went to LAUSD High School and I played both basketball and baseball. And I observed there was a, a lot of money on the table for a lot of these sport events, and it didn't seem to go back to the school. <clears throat> I want to know, Mr. Zimmer, is there is there any way that athletic policy? Hey, excuse me for one second, Hanif. Can we please give a hand to Council Member? <laughs> Go ahead, I'm sorry. Do you do you think that athletic policy reform in the city can make a significant um, boost in revenue for the city, and and why hasn't those re why haven't those reforms taken place already to, to for that revenue? It's a great question, Eve? And, and that's exactly what that that's exactly when when we say revenue reduction balance, um, that's what I'm talking about. Is that we have to look creatively to all of the different programs, the athletics, the arts, we have to look to partnerships, we have to look for ways that, that, we, can, that we can increase revenue. Again, it's, it's a mindset. You know, we, never, we never thought about, we never thought our, of ourselves as a, as a revenue generating body. So it's a, complete, it's a complete change. Athletics was on the table today. When we were talking about how can we, um, how can we, raise enough revenue through our athletics programs to make it basically cost neutral. Um, and you and would raise this revenue for what, from students or from you know, I mean, participants? There, there, there are, I mean, I'm going to lay it out there. It's not something I'm very comfortable with, but sponsorship. And, um, you know, our schools aren't for sale to the highest bidder or anything like that. But, um, you know, there, there's all... going to have like the Microsoft... Uh, team at uh, uni high um, or, or we, the... we can we can open up opportunities for people to invest oh, okay. and, um, and and there are other there are other revenue generating functions that, that we can do look we don't want to cut athletics athletics the arts that's what hooks kids look if it wasn't for the arts I would have never graduated from high school honestly I was a, I was not a good student I was not motivated but I like to write and I like to be on stage and I, most of the people I hung with, if they weren't involved in athletics, they wouldn't have graduated. And so, you know, those are not things we can cut, but we can look more creatively at them to see, you know, where can we, you know, where are the opportunities for revenue? Assembly member? I, I just wanted to piggyback on that because I'm a firm supporter in this, and that's music to my ears to hear Mr. Zimmerman talk about looking at corporate America. There's a program that I've had the opportunity to get introduced to since been on the assembly. It's called Generation Next. And they're working in some of the San Gabriel school districts and uh, out toward um, uh, San Bernardino. And I believe they've even met with your president uh, for a brief conversation uh, regarding this. And it's about, we talk about healthy kids. It's like working with Food for Less or Ralph's and putting a bushel of apples in the hallway. That average kid might not eat an apple, but now that Ralph's is putting that signage there and putting that bushel of apples there that they would typically not even sell, they're putting them on these campuses. It's branding for them, but it's also selling healthy nutrition for students. As you say, most kids come to school hungry. So these are some of the creative things they can do without necessarily selling the school off. And uh, also, it was uh, Marty uh, Heichelberg, I believe, or uh, yeah, he was on uh, TV this morning. Hillman. Tittleman. Hittleman. Yeah, Hittleman, Hittleman, I'm sorry. And he's talking about corporate taxes for uh, corporations that invest in schools. Right. These are s smart joint partnerships that you need. You need public-private partnerships. So I think it's a great opportunity to move in that direction. State law requires us to, lay, to notice uh, certificated employees, <coughs> principals and teachers, faculty members, uh, by March 15th. If they're so going to be laid off. If they're going August. to be laid off. So those were the notices that had to be voted upon this week. The other layoffs uh, of classified employees, uh, of, of all the other parts of our family that make LAUSD work, that has a 45-day uh, state ed code requirement around it. So although you just saw the teachers this week, and the direct school personnel that require the March 15th notice, the actual number of everybody that's going to be that's going to get noticed is much closer to 8,000 to 9,000 wow. school employees. But let me so, get this straight: 12 billion dollar budget. Right. That's greater than the gross domestic product of all of Central America and Caribbean. 
Caribbean islands. That's over 20 nations. That's that budget for LA Unified is bigger than those 20 economies. Yeah, Com completely. It's, it's unreal. It's it is unreal. And 85 percent of that money goes to pay teachers. No, 85 percent of that money, in some way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. is in is, is in salary. It's in people. Not not to the, the entire LA USD family. You got to remember, we just completed the single biggest public works project in the nation, the largest school building project ever that, that has ever existed. And, um, and so there's, there's a ton of people wrapped up in that. I mean, it, I mean that capital good, project stable was over union jobs. That's $20 billion. Jobs. That's correct. And that's not part of this $12 billion that's not every part year. Of 12. I mean, but, but the scope and the scale is profound. It is absolutely profound. Hi, my name is David Azevedo, uh, political science major, uh, junior. Really glad that you guys are here with us tonight. It's been very insightful. Uh, my question is about uh, making money work at the state level. Um, that's, that's an ambitious question, and this is uh, directed towards you, um, Assemblyman. Um, I know that you've only been in here for six, six months now, but in your experience and in you preparing for the job, um, you say that we need more revenue, and it's, it's, it's very obvious. I mean, uh, the economy has really strapped us for cash, um, but what I really see in Sacramento in my own research and my own paying attention of the political situation is that um, there's been a huge lack of leadership and management of the state's resources by the assembly for the past a couple decades. It just does not seem like the assembly can handle any kind of financial responsibility for a state that's the largest in the country and it's one of the biggest economies in the state. So my question is not about how do we get more resources or how do we get more revenue, but making that work. Well, I wish I had the answer. I probably would be governor. Uh, but the point, I, I, I got to take a little exception to that because, again, I, I go back to term limits. And you have a whole lot of smart people in the legislature, a whole lot of smart people who don't want to cut programs. But when you have people within your own caucus who are running for statewide office, we currently have eight Democrats who are running for statewide office. So that means they don't vote on a lot of stuff they would have normally voted on because if they're running for AG, they don't want to offend law enforcement. If they're running for uh, uh, superintendent of public education, they don't want to offend teachers. So you find folks pigeonholed, again, based on term limits. That's not in and of itself, but also you have a, many, many different departments. And even though you hear California's budget being as large as it is, only 10% of that can we really play with. All of the rest of it is directed by initiatives and propositions like Prop 98, Prop that tells you where those monies can be used and how they can be used. So it's not a big pool of money to play with at the end of the day. So the cuts that you wind up uh, dealing with are general fund money that's I say 10% of the total uh, budget that we can mess with. So without raising revenues, I don't think the legislators in and of themselves, there are departments, case in point, I sit on a housing and community development uh, com committee. We had a housing issue on homelessness uh, about three weeks ago. State of California, through the housing and development uh, department, left $5 million on the table. That's not, that sounds like a whole lot of money, but when you talk about people who are losing their homes due to foreclosure, that money could have been used with, uh, for uh, making a house note, helping them assistance with their house note, helping them with a utility bill for those who are already home, uh, homeless, helping them with uh, a security deposit or uh, rent for uh, apartment. We left $5 million on it, a different depart department. So we have a bunch of siloed entities that are very ineffective, EDD for once. If you're unemployed right now, it might take you sometimes six months to be processed. And you want to know if you go in there right now and you fill out your application, chances are your application will not be processed. Know how you want to get processed the quickest? You appeal your denial. An appeal will get you processed quicker than the regular process. But it costs us more money once to appeal the process. We got to go appeal hearing, but at the end of the day, you get your money. So it sounds like the assembly is irrelevant at this Well, point. we can't control all those departments, so if we could get our hands around that, but by the time we figure all this out and we see where the problems are, you're out the door. But, you know, we talked about political gridlock in that 
in a mature democracy, there are so many solidified interest groups and so many institutions, and we talk about fragmentations mm -hmm. now, so many levels of government was really one of the themes of this panel that we, Without a doubt. That, that even Council Member Rosendahl was talking about another level, neighborhood councils. And here we're not even talking about the County Board of Supervisors, which is another level, or a member of Congress, which is another level, or water districts or other type of things. So that when you try to do something that we've become so complicated for so many regulatory reasons that we can't, we can't seem to make a quick decision. Nobody has the power. I think earlier we talked about um, Mayor Villaraigosa in that first session we had about how little power he had and that he was a, 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 in a weak mayor system. So it, it's, it's frustrating. You could understand the frustration of people. Who do we blame? can't blame the governor because he blames the legislature. We can't blame the legislature because they blame Congress. We can't blame Congress because the school board won't do what it's supposed to do. And we can't blame the school board because they don't have the money. So um, who's in charge? We're all responsible. And I, I think this class is a prime example of folks who are interested in, 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 in moving the state forward, moving government forward. But we have to stay engaged because the biggest thing we're watching right now 18 months ago, we saw this amazing wave of change. Everybody voted for President Barack Obama, and they thought he was going to come in with this magic wand simply because he was there and just change everything that was wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not happening because most of those Barack Obama voters are back at home under a rock, not even engaged in the discussion. People have to stay engaged in the discussion. You have to hold your elected officials accountable, but at the same time, you, you just can't point fingers at them. You gotta give them ideas, as the councilman stated. When I was a city councilman, I hit what's called Open City Hall. Every quarter, you can come into my office, no appointment necessary, not Monday through Friday, on a Saturday. And from eight to 12, you can spend as much time as you wanted, talking to me about what was wrong with Gardena or what was well with Gardena. As long as there was nobody in the uh, waiting room. If it was a waiting room, you got 15 minutes. But it allowed me to engage with you, and we fixed the problems in Gardena. And that's what we need to do on the state level and on the federal level. Keep folks involved, and that sounds very simplistic, but at the same time, we have to streamline all these different divisions. You got Department of Transportation doing what, with a pool of money. You have you know, Caltrans with a pool of money. You have EDD with a pool of money. You have Veterans Affairs with a pool of money. Some of these departments aren't needed. So, Get rid of some of those layers of government, too. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next question. But uh, you know, you, we rather the, you, you said you need to grow the pie. Well, what's what are some examples of, of ways that we can uh, bring bring more revenue in? I, and, and just just ideas from you, I, because I mean, it seems to me that we certainly cutting is necessary, but. You know, <coughs> hey, it's it's college students who believe in AB six five six. AB six five six. It's the oil extraction fee that they many were on the uh, steps of the Capitol today saying oil companies should pay an extraction fee here in California for all the oil that they bring out of the ground. Yeah, it would raise another two billion dollars in California. Well, explain that Texas, Oklahoma, and Alaska, and California are the four biggest producers of oil. oil. Those three states. Mm -hmm. all tax the oil when it comes out. We do not. Yeah. But, but, on the, but on the other hand, those three states don't have an income tax. It, it don't have an in income tax nor a corporate tax. So it's, it's a trade-off there. But there are folks who are talking about that. Uh, my colleague, Alberto Tarico has introduced that bill. It's getting a lot of... Uh, How much? So $2 billion. Yes. And, and so we, college students love it. Because the but we have 18 billion to go. We have a 20 billion dollar deficit. Yes, billion. vehicle license fee that yep. our governor ran on by taking it away, knocked Gray Davis, got Gray Davis recalled, and now if you ask Arnold Schwarzenegger, he wish he had that vehicle license yeah, fee. Yeah, but you know I'm, I'm pretty liberal and I'm always about raising taxes, but I hate that vehicle license because it all comes at one time in a you know when you just you don't want to really pay it. And but you, you shouldn't buy those expensive again. cars. Uh, <laughs> All right, let's give our uh, panelists a good hand. <laughs>